Greetings viewers and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to remake an old video on how to do a pre-purchase inspection on a Subaru to help you from getting burned buying a hunk of junk. Now, before we get into the video, let me put as a disclaimer, uh, these checks and inspection before purchase is not a guarantee that you will not have a major issue, uh, nor will the car later on have a major issue. This is just a little taste of what I do when I go to purchase a vehicle myself, what I go over, what I look for, and what I try to uh, point out and see uh, if we're going to have issues long term or if it's a decent vehicle. Again, nothing is guaranteed, especially when it comes to mechanical stuff, but this is a good baseline to use uh, as a pre-purchase inspection. Uh, in the last video on buying a used Subaru, uh, there was a lot more tests that were in depth on that video that normal Tom, Dick, and Harry is not going to do, say at a used car lot, at the Subaru dealership looking to use car, or at buying a car from a private seller. Uh, so this is going to be a more uh, bare bones inspection. Uh, we're not going to get as in depth on that one. It's just something that you can do really quickly uh, without you know having to jack the car up or do anything crazy or have any special tools with you other than say a rag and a tire pressure gauge, probably be bare minimum, maybe a pocket screwdriver. You know, minimal stuff, uh, minimally invasive, just to check out to see what you're buying. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look. I've got, this is a vehicle checkup sheet. This is something I had at my shop. It was just a generic form. You can find these or examples of these with a quick Google search. I'll see if I can put up a big picture on the screen or scan this in to show you or link it somewhere else. Uh, but basically all it is is a uh, 27 point vehicle inspection chart, pretty generic for any auto repair shop or dealership would go over. Uh, it basically has got a red, yellow, and a green. Yes, uh, no, or caution for certain parameters on the car. We look at all the tire pressures. We look at all the tire wear pattern and the tread depth. We look at the condition and level of engine oil, coolant, brake fluid, power steering fluid, transmission fluid, wiper, washer fluid. Uh, look at the front brake pad shocks, transfer case, differential, CV axles, U-joints, suspension, front and rear exhaust, steering components, uh, rear brakes, your battery, your lamps, uh, windshield, windshield wipers, cooling system, air filter, uh, all the various hoses and belts. So again, you can't in depth check this stuff at a dealer lot on a used car lot, things of that nature, but there are tips and tricks to, uh, you know, get a better sense of the condition of this stuff. Uh, it's always good if you are buying from a dealership, one for it to be a certified pre-owned Subaru. Uh, they are required to have, I believe, a 120 something point inspection. It may be more than that, maybe less, but it's quite a lot of things on a list for a Subaru vehicle to be certified pre-owned. And you get a better warranty buying a certified pre-owned Subaru than buying a brand new Subaru. I know that's kind of mind blowing, but Subaru gives a better warranty on their certified pre-owned cars than buying a brand new car off the lot. So if you're trying to save some money and save some depreciation, uh, buying a used, certified used uh, Subaru is usually a better option than buying a brand spanking new car. Just so you know, this does not specifically go along with buying a late model Subaru of the last four or five years. This will cover all the way back into the late 80s, early 90s. If you worked on Subarus for a while or owned Subarus for a while, uh, you may know that Subarus like to keep things simple. They share lots of parts and lots of components across all their models. Uh, the ball joints, for example, have basically been the exact same ball joint since the very late 80s in every single Subaru to current. I believe recently they changed the ball joint for the Ascent model and the new Outback Legacy chassis and uh, the Tribeca had its own unique ball joint. But other than that, basically every single Subaru in the last 30 years has used the exact same part number, exact same ball joint. There are many examples of this kind of shared uh, across platform parts from Subaru uh, because it helped them keep costs low, manufacturing costs and parts costs low being that they were a smaller uh, auto manufacturer. So like I said, getting off topic a little bit, which I'm good about doing, 
but we're gonna go ahead and get into checking out a Subaru. Again, we're gonna be using, as an example, my 2002 Outback L.L. Bean, uh, but this can be used on as new as a 2018, 2019 used, and as old as an 89, 90 used Legacy. It's basically all the same things to look for and basically the same components to look out for. There are some differences uh, with the newer CVT transmissions and the F-Series engines compared to the EZ and EJ series engines, uh, but we'll try to go over every different one and how to check them out. And uh, I'm gonna try to put some timestamps at the bottom of the video so you can skip around to find the most prudent information for you because this is probably gonna be a longer video uh, given the amount of variation uh, through the years and the different things you need to check. So starting off our inspection, we're gonna be looking at the tires. Tires are a very critical component on any Subaru vehicle due to the all-wheel drive system. Subaru has a tolerance for tire wear. All four tires have to be the exact same brand, same model, and they all have to be within uh, two to three 30 seconds tread wear of each other. Uh, the fact is that if your tires are mismatched, uh, you're going to have issues, you're going to have lots of vibration, the car's going to ride horrible, and you can possibly damage uh, the center differential or uh, have issues with the drivetrain with your all-wheel drive system. And the reason for this is that every single tire manufacturer, uh, the different tread patterns, uh, they're not always the exact same tread depth. They don't always uh, have the exact same measurements. Uh, so you can have two tires that are the exact same size, they can be a uh, 225 60 16, but two different manufacturers may have a slightly taller tire that's a 225 16 than another one just based on the type of uh, design in the tread pattern itself. Uh, so the point of the whole, you've got to get the tires within two to three 30 seconds of each other, is that the more a tire wears, the smaller it becomes essentially, the overall circumference of it. And as your circum or circumference shrinks, the rotation speed changes. So if you've got two tires that are brand new on the front and two very old worn tires on the rear, the rears are gonna spin slightly faster than the front tires because the front tires are taller and have more meat on them than the rear tires. This will create torque bind in the all-wheel drive system and have the front axle and rear axle fighting each other. That's not something you want. So whenever looking at a Subaru, make sure all four tires are the same brand, same model, uh, same size. Make sure that, check the wear pattern. As you see here on my 2002 uh, LL Bean, that we have very slick outside here. This is not good. We've actually got a piece coming up. These tires are quite old. They've got some dry rod in them. Uh, I have new tires ordered. I just haven't gone and picked them up yet for my buddy. So we're past due for a tire on this car. Uh, the alignment is out, as we can tell from the wearing on the outside of the tire. Uh, I'll try to put a chart up showing tire wear and the patterns you see with different issues with the suspension. Uh, that's important because checking the tires uh, can give you some idea if maybe you have uh, a bad tie rod inner or outer, you have a bad, uh, uh, bad struts on the front. Uh, it can tell you all kinds of things about the health of the car, suspension, and steering system uh, just by looking at your tires. So you don't have to jack the car up, you don't have to take a pry bar and you know, check these components individually. Uh, you can just get a good idea looking at the condition of the tires. Now most dealers will go ahead and put a cheap set of tires on a car before they resell it uh, to make it look like it's a better car. Uh, but when you're dealing with a private seller, you know, you may come across cars that have bald tires, bad tires, mismatched tires. Just keep that in mind that that could have caused damage in the drivetrain and it's something to be leery of. So again, uh, you want to check tire pressure. If any of them look slack, make sure they're the same make model, make sure the same tire size. And uh, if you want to pick up a tire tread depth gauge, uh, you can normally get those at AutoZone, Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly's, any other parts house for a buck or two. Uh, just if you want to check the, see how much tread the tires have to know if you're going to have to purchase a uh, six, seven, eight hundred dollar plus set of tires uh, not long after purchasing your new car. So that's the first thing we want to check. Check the tires. It's a very critical component on any Subaru vehicle. 
All right, guys, as you probably noticed, we're not on the Outback anymore. We're actually on my cross track. I actually forgot to film the part about checking the brakes yesterday. So really quickly, you want to take a look at your brake rotor, make sure that it's nice and even all the way across, make sure there's no dips or scars in it, make sure there's no big lip at the top. That would indicate that, uh, you know, they probably replaced pads in the past and didn't machine the rotor down. Uh, so just be cognizant of stuff like that. Uh, depending on the wheels, sometimes you can look in here and get a good look at the pads to see what the thickness is like. Sometimes you can't. Uh, so, you know, it's limited what you can actually check on these brakes. Uh, it's very limited what you can check with a drum brake on the rear because you can't see through the drum. Uh, looking here, it looks like we do have an issue with hardware. Uh, looks like someone did not put the brakes, uh, brake pads on this car correctly at the dealership because it was dealer serviced. I haven't messed with the brakes. Uh, so yeah, just take a good look at the rotor surface, make sure it's smooth all the way across and uniform and uh, try to peek your head or, you know, try to drive the car up enough where you get a spot in the wheel where you can peek through and try to gauge the thickness of those brake pads. So moving from the tires to under the hood, uh, most dealerships really won't have an issue with you checking under the hood on the car, but make sure that you get down to business right away. Don't take too much time under here, uh, but do a thorough look around. Uh, first, look around the engine compartment, see if you see any fluid leaks, anything of that nature. Most of these newer cars have an engine cover on them, which I do not like. Uh, they're supposedly for beauty, but all they do is hold heat on the engine and cover up anything that might be yucky you don't want to see, like possibly a leaking uh, cam cover gasket or oil or coolant leaking on top of the engine or a power steering pump leaking on top of the engine. It hides information that you need. So most of these are held on by 10 millimeter fasteners. Uh, if you want to bring a small quarter inch ratchet and 10 millimeter socket, that can get you by a lot of things you want to get by. So pulling the cover off, normally they won't object to. Most of the modern ones just have snaps and come off by pulling them. Uh, but just be careful that you know how they come off because you don't want to break them while you're looking at a car on the dealer lot. So after we've done our visual inspection, uh, you know, make sure your wiring is good. Look for any chafed wiring, look for any chafed um, uh, AC lines or any insulation. Uh, modern Subarus had an issue where the conduit used on the wiring harnesses uh, were made of an organic material that attracted rodents. Uh, I personally went and looked at a 2016 Outback a few years back and actually found a rat's nest under the intake manifold. Pulled the engine cover up, looked under the, beside the throttle body and intake manifold, found a rodent's nest on top of the engine. Also look at the insulation under the hood, the fire blanket, see if there's any signs of rodent damage. Look at the fire blanket on the back of the firewall back here. Make sure there's no chunks pulled out, things of that nature. Make sure none of the wiring harness has been gnawed on. Uh, you know, just general visual inspection can tell you a lot about a vehicle. Moving from there, your fluids. Subaru is very user friendly in the fact that almost every single Subaru model from late 80s to current have bright yellow caps to indicate the various fluids on the car. So the same layout is basically how all Subarus are. They've not changed very much over the years, the washer fluid reservoir has moved location, but everything else is basically in the same location. Bright yellow oil cap, bright yellow oil dipstick. On your newer F-Series engines, it'll be on the opposite side of the engine, but on EJs and EZs and the older engines, they're right here on the driver's side for US buyers for left-hand drive vehicles. Uh, your coolant reservoir is just forward to that on the radiator and your radiator cap is here. If you want to check your coolant, please do not pull this cap off if the car is hot or warm. Make sure it is stone cold. Do not take this thing off. You will get scalding hot coolant blown in your face. Not a good time. So check your coolant level in the jug. There is a high and low. If it's cold, take the cap off. Check the coolant level. Look underneath the cap. Sometimes if you've got a blown head gasket, which is an issue on the older single overhead cam and dual overhead cam non-turbo engines, uh, you might have some buildup on that cap. Now that is not always an end all be all that you have a head gasket issue. You might have had a head gasket issue at one point and it was repaired and they just didn't clean or flush the cooling system or the Subaru engine 
cooling system conditioner. It can leave that residue as well, which was a stop leak additive Subaru put in during the late 90s uh, through the 2000s uh, to try to combat the head gasket issues they had. So be aware of that, that that's not always a telltale sign of a head gasket issue. Also check under the oil cap. You could have residue again, uh, but not always a sign of a current head gasket failure. It could just be a poorly done head gasket replacement where they didn't clean up well after the repair was done. Check your battery cables. Make sure you don't have a bunch of corrosion and crusties on here. Uh, a lot of the issues with the head gasket issues actually stem from issues with the battery and corrosion. That's a little bit of uh, a lot of to get into, but basically what it turns into is if your cooling system is not properly serviced, your coolant breaks down and basically turns the engine into a battery. It starts conducting electricity through the cooling system and the crusties are a sign that that, uh, I believe electrolysis is happening and that can be detrimental to the graphite coating on the head gaskets. Uh, so be aware of that. Look to make sure the battery has been properly maintained and cleaned regularly. Check washer fluid, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's not that vital. Your brake fluid's back here on the master cylinder hooked to the vacuum brake booster just forward of where the pedals and the steering wheel are. So check the condition of it, check the level of it. There's a sight glass on the side of the container, high and low. Uh, the fluid should be clear. If it's dark or black, that's not a good sign. It needs to be replaced. Uh, people often talk about brake fluid being a quote unquote scam service flushing brake fluid, uh, but it absolutely is not. Brake fluid is a hydroscopic fluid, which means that it tracks moisture, attracts water. Uh, so anytime you get a bottle of brake fluid, it always tells you to keep the lid on tightly until you plan to use it uh, because humidity in the air will be pulled into the brake fluid. Brakes, brake system, brake fluid is a hydraulic fluid. Anytime you get moisture or water built up in a hydraulic system, that is a no good situation. Plus the water buildup in the fluid starts corroding the inside of your metal brake lines, your brake calipers and other hardline components of the braking system. That's what turns the fluid from clear to dark is that corrosion and breakdown of the fluid breaking down and corroding the inside of the braking system. So make sure that the brake fluid is relatively clear. Um, it comes out like water essentially new. Uh, an amber color would probably be as dark as I'd like to see it. So if you see dark brown or black, that's a bad sign that no one has properly maintained their braking system. Not necessarily gonna say you're gonna see braking issues, uh, but it will dramatically reduce the pedal feel of the braking system and the force exerted on the brakes when pushing the pedal. Uh, if you flush your brake fluid, it will greatly improve the pedal feel and give you a nice, more firm uh, brake feel. Uh, from there, you can check the condition of your upper radiator hose on the four cylinder model is you normally can sight down between the radiator and the front of the engine to see the lower hose. Uh, just make sure that they're not swollen, make sure they're not contaminated with oil, uh, make sure that they don't look like they're cracked or frayed or you know getting old. Sight your serpentine belt. You don't have to bring a serpentine belt uh, measuring tool. Uh, just look at the belt, make sure it's not cracking, it doesn't have a glaze on the back side of it, and make sure that the ribs of the belt are still fairly um, flat. If you have really deep grooves and you've got cracks on the belt, you're going to need a belt very soon. So make sure to check your belt along with your hoses. Uh, moving on from there, you may or may not be able to pop open the air box. It's rather easy to just chuck take a look at the air filter, but air filters are so cheap, uh, it probably wouldn't be advised. Uh, private party sale, sure, pop the air box open, look at the air, box, uh, air filter. Uh, at the dealer lot, most likely they've at least put an air filter in it. Uh, from there, on automatic equipped vehicles with four EAT and five EAT conventional automatic transmissions, your transmission dipstick is right here where my hand is pointing. At the back of the engine, you'll see the two heater hoses and your power wires to your starter. Uh, a yellow dipstick is right here. That is your automatic transmission fluid. Your power steering fluid is on the other side of the engine bay, either on a reservoir offset in the fender wheel or on top of the power steering pump itself, depending on the age of the vehicle. Your front differential gear oil will be on the opposite side of the transmission as your transmission fluid dipstick. 
also marked bright yellow and has stamped DIFF in the dipstick to indicate the differential uh, gear oil for the front differential. So a good check of those fluids, quick rag, wipe off the dipstick, check them all. Uh, with the power, uh, automatic transmission fluid, the transmission does have to be uh, the car does have to be running to check the transmission fluid uh, properly. Uh, cannot check it with the engine off. So engine running in park after running through the gears for stationary and uh, you're good to go on that. Uh, on manual transmission equipped vehicles, you do not have a transmission dipstick here. You only have the gear oil dipstick on the passenger side or right side of the vehicle. So that will be your gear oil level for the entire transmission, not just the front differential. On automatic transmissions, the two fluids are separated. Gear oil in the front differential, automatic transmission fluid in the automatic transmission. With the manual transmission, all the gear set for the transmission itself and the front differential are all open and share gear oil together with one dipstick. Moving to the rear differential, you're not going to be able to check the fluid in that because it requires tools to get in there. But other than that, that basically gives you a look at every single fluid on the car, most accessed very conveniently here under the hood. So one quick tip before moving on, if you're looking at a uh, 2011, 2012 or newer Subaru around that model year, they phased out hydraulic power steering and went all electric. So you will no longer see a power steering pump nor a reservoir to check fluid on, so just be uh, conscious of that. So on to lights and fixtures. This is not something you really should have to worry about if buying from a qualified dealer or used car lot, more so from an individual, but you wanna turn on your headlights, check the low beams, check the high beams, check the fog lights, turn signals, brake lights, all of those functions, hazard light switch. Uh, not saying that it's automatically going to be some kind of more involved repair aside from maybe a burnt out bulb, but you'd rather check it now than after you purchase it and find out that maybe you need a multifunction switch with the headlight switch on it, you know, several hundred dollars, or you need to pay someone hours of diagnostic labor in tracing down wiring issues. So it's always good to just do a quick bulb check. Uh, you can hit the hazard light switch, walk around the car, turn the headlights on, hit the high beam, low beam fog light switch, have someone behind while you hit the brakes or have the salesman hit the brakes while you stand behind just to check the brake light function. Just really quick and easy thing to do to make sure that you're not gonna have any more expensive issues down the road once you've bought the car. So now that we've established that all the fluids are good and that our lighting system is in good working order, uh, we can do some suspension checks. Now these aren't the end all be all most accurate test. Uh, it's an old school method basically uh, to check your shock absorbers slash struts would be to start bouncing the car up and down, uh, stop bouncing it and see how long it takes the rebound to stop. Uh, with a good set of shocks, you should be able to see the car stop in one to one and a half rebounds and stabilize neutral. Uh, if the shocks are blown or bad, the car will start bouncing very erratically and or once you stop, it will take it two or three or more oscillations to balance back out to neutral. Uh, again, the dealer will probably look at you funny if you're bouncing off the back of a two-year-old outback at the dealer. So be forewarned and use your best judgment in this. See, as soon as I stop, it basically comes back to neutral. There's no more bobbing and I can't really get it bucking erratically or crazily up and down. Even when I put more of my body weight and more effort on it, you see one, one and a half rebounds and it's back to neutral. So pretty decent shock absorber slash struts on the back of the car. We'll do the same with the front of the vehicle as well. As you see, basically it stops immediately when I stop applying a downward force. You can also use this as an opportunity to listen for any squeaks 
or pops or any odd noises in the suspension when moving it up and down by hand. So always use your five senses. Well, not all five, you don't really need to use taste, although I do know some technicians that like to test uh, different fluid leaks by tasting them, but well, that's another story completely. So always have your eyes and ears open and your sense of touch is great in helping you to diagnose or evaluate any issues you may have with a potential vehicle purchase. All right, so from there, this one is a little bit more tricky, especially, uh, as I said, not being able to jack the vehicle up, not be able to thoroughly inspect it would be the visual inspection of the undercarriage. I know not a lot of people are comfortable getting down on their hands and knees or laying down in a parking lot at a car dealership to look under a vehicle, uh, but I have no shame. I've crawled completely under a car in the parking lot before and drew a crowd of uh, confused uh, salespeople. Pretty funny, <laughs> but I like to uh, check them as thoroughly as I can before purchasing anything. Uh, so it never hurts to squat down, peek your head into the car, or lay on the ground and uh, check it. If it's paved and it's dry, I mean, what are you hurting at the end of the day? So you can get a good sense of the condition of the vehicle. Uh, you can eyeball your rear diff bushings, which uh, are right here. Uh, see if you see any cracking in them, splits in them, etc. cetera. Uh, you can check your differential right here, check for any leaks, any fluid draining down. Uh, you can look for rust or damage to your exhaust system with a visual inspection. Uh, look for any damaged bent control arms, any signs that something has been run over and struck the undercarriage, uh, any signs of uh, rust. Rust is another issue, especially you northern viewers uh, that are mainly buying these cars. You want to check to make sure that the frame, subframe is not just going to break and fall out of the car. So getting underneath and looking under the car visually is better than nothing. Uh, it's not as good as having it on the lift where you can check the actual suspension components and things of that nature and check the rear differential fluid. But with limited access, this is better than nothing. So get down and check it out. Look for any leaks, uh, not only with the rear side of the vehicle as well. You can usually get a good uh, line of sight on the transmission pan. A uh, good thing about Subaru vehicles, Forester Outback, etc., cross track, they sit quite high. So you do have quite a bit of visibility under the car without having to jack it up. So take the time, scooch down, lean down, bend over, and pop your head under there and see what you see. It could save you a costly mistake in buying a vehicle. So as well as the rear of the vehicle, check the front of the vehicle. Uh, most Subaru vehicles will have a plastic shield under here that will block your line of sight to the engine, which I don't really care for. As you see, my Outback does not have that plastic tray. Normally they get tore up and destroyed, so normally with age, most of them are missing anyway. Uh, you can get a very good look to see if there's any fluid leaks from the oil pan. Uh, see if you've got any more damage to the front of the exhaust system. Uh, you can check visually the front suspension. You can look for coolant leaks from the radiator, lower radiator hose, thermostat housing. Uh, you know, it's a good idea to stick your head under here. If you're looking at a single overhead cam 2.5 liter EJ series engine, you can get a good line of sight usually on the parting line between the block and the heads. Normally when they have a head gasket failure, that model, they leak oil and coolant externally between the block and the cylinder head. So if you see oil or coolant buildup, you know you've got a bad head gasket. So a visual inspection normally is all you need on those to know if you've got a head gasket leak. Uh, as well with that, you can get a good look at your suspension. You can see if the boots are torn or destroyed on your ball joints. You can't necessarily check them for play, but you can at least see if the boots are tore up and if the boots are good, that's a good indicator that the ball joint is in decent shape. Along with the tie rods above it, uh, your sway bar bushings and any links, you can check the condition of those, see if they're looking ragged or tattered. Uh, make sure that again that the uh, Again, checking to see if the boots are torn on the end links. Uh, not so much on this model, but the newer ones do have uh, spherical hind joints with a boot on them, so check that. And uh, see if your sway bar bushings are torn and mushing out of the sides of the sway bar bushing bracket there. Again, on the cross track, one other thing I failed to mention earlier, visually expecting the suspension. Uh, again, due to the ride height of most Subaru vehicles, uh, you can normally sight the strut. If you pull up this bellow, uh, you can see if you have a leaking strut. So another very quick and easy visual inspection you can do uh, to check the condition of the suspension system.
All right, so before we wrap up our exterior and visual inspections of the vehicle, uh, we'll check for collision damage. Collision damage is not something that most people are really good at spotting, at least I've seen in my experience. Uh, but when you know certain things to look out for, it becomes much easier to figure out. Um, whether a car has been wrecked or in a collision is not a deal breaker per se, uh, but it also depends on how severely the car was wrecked and who repaired it, whether it was repaired accurately and correctly, or if it was repaired in someone's backyard. There's a big difference there. Or if you have frame damage. Uh, so there are some quick tips to use to check for evidence uh, that a vehicle has been wrecked. Uh, firstly, uh, the main telltale sign of front end collision would be a differentiation in the headlights. Modern plastic housing headlights are bad to crust up and corrode as we mostly all know at this point. Uh, so if you've got one corroded or old looking headlight and one brand spanking new sparkly bright clear headlight, that's usually a clear indication that a front end collision or some major damage happened to that front side of the vehicle. Usually you can get down and check the headlight. Uh, a genuine headlight will say Subaru in the bottom of the lens. Uh, if you see TYC, uh, Depot, or any other name like that, most likely it is a crash part from a uh, body shop. They normally do not buy OEM parts unless the vehicle is within two or three years old. After that, they're normally buying aftermarket parts for cost savings. So check that. Um, look at the front bumper. Look inside the front bumper and the front grill. Check for paint overspray on the AC condenser and the radiator. Telltale sign that a car has been wrecked and painted and repaired very cheaply because they painted the front bumper on the car rather than removing the front bumper, painting it separately, and then reinstalling on the car. So any paint overspray underneath on top of the radiator support, look for primer, look for a uh, base coat, look for any overspray. That's always a telltale giveaway right away sign that it's been wrecked. Look for differentiation of the paint quality between body panels. If the paint looks much better on one door than the other or on the hood compared to the fender, a uh, dead giveaway again that has been repaired cheaply uh, by uh, them only painting the component that was replaced rather than uh, a good repair where the paint would be blended into the surrounding body panels to mask that repair. Uh, check for orange peel, uh, check for streaks, runs in the paint, uh, check for any dents in the surfaces. Open up your doors, check the door jams. Those are usually a good telltale sign too. If the paint on the outside looks better than the paint on the door jam that's not seen UV damage and has been basically protected this whole life, that's another sign that some wreckage has happened and some repair work has happened. Uh, look again in the door jams for overspray. Most of the time when taping off and painting doors, uh, they do so on car now and they do get overspray inside of the door jams and they rarely clean it. So another sign that you've got issues. Under the hood, you can check the two frame rails on either side of the engine where they come to the front bumper support. Look in those seams. They're normally sealed with seam sealer. If that seam sealer is missing or if you see wrinkles in the metal, another sign that frame damage has occurred and the frames have been pulled back out. Uh, there's lots of little telltale signs that when you've been around bodywork and been around collision, uh, you can pretty much pick apart a car and tell if it's been wrecked or not. When I'm looking at a vehicle, information from the owner is taken with a grain of salt. Uh, normally, I use the owner's responses to my questions as a litmus test to know if they're lying to me or going to be honest to me. The car normally tells me everything I want to know. Uh, so I just compare what the car tells me to what the owner tells me. The car's not going to lie to me. The owner will lie to me in private party sales. So just keep that in mind and, uh, you know, do your homework. If uh, it doesn't smell right and they're telling you something different, uh, that car is not lying to you. That person is, so just keep that in mind. So you've done your visual inspection around the car. You're getting the car ready to go on that test drive. Uh, before you start the engine up, turn the key to the on position. Do not crank it. Make sure that all your lights illuminate like they should. Make sure to check engine light, uh, airbag lights, ABS lights. Uh, make sure that the oil pressure light, all of those lights light up and then go off once you start the engine. 
If your check engine light remains on, most likely won't be the case. If you're buying from a dealership or a reputable used car lot, uh, then you've got an issue. If the check engine light remains on, you know, most of the time if it's a private individual, they most likely don't know themselves what the check engine light's on for, or they may tell you it's nothing or an oxygen sensor or a catalytic converter, something minimal to put you at ease. So investing in a code reader, just a run of the mill cheapo code reader is a great tool to have with you in this instance. Not only when buying a car, but in the ownership of your own car. Instead of having to rely on running to the dealership, running to your mechanic, running to a parts store to get the codes read, keep a code reader, a cheap code reader can be had for 20, 30, 40 bucks on Amazon. They're very affordable nowadays. You know, keep it in your glove box. It's a great tool to have with you at all times. Uh, this is an old Innovo code reader. I've had it for over a decade at this point. I believe I bought it at Walmart years and years ago. Now, just a quick code reader. All it does is give me codes, no live data, but it's invaluable if you're looking at buying a car that's got a check engine light on. Don't trust what they say. Trust what the code reader tells you. You might have a serious engine issue or transmission issue or brake issue or airbag issue. They might just be telling you, oh, it's just an oxygen sensor, don't worry about it. Or, oh, it's a dirty mass air sensor. They're not gonna be honest with you 100% of the time. They're trying to sell you something that they no longer want, either as a business or an individual. So a code reader is invaluable to have with you to check those check engine lights if they come up. Once you've checked codes, made sure there's no check engine light, go ahead and start that engine up. Turn your ears in. You want to listen for any odd sounds on startup. Is that AC compressor making a weird noise when it engaged? Is the alternator whining? Are you hearing weird noises from the transmission or engine idling? Get back out of the car, pop the hood, put your ear down in around the engine bay. Are you hearing weird sounds from any of the components? Uh, you know, your ears are a valuable tool in this in checking to see if there's any issues. Uh, if you've got a time and belt EJ series engine, you know, listen for any noises in the timing set, especially if you're around 100,000 miles or just past 100,000 miles. Perhaps they have not replaced the timing set yet and you've got a timing idler bearing that's going out. Uh, that will wreck your engine if it goes out. You know, that's something that's a major service that you need to be cognizant of before you put your money down to purchase that vehicle. Not always will they be honest with you or truthful with you about service history. So you've got to do some due diligence and detective work yourself. Uh, listen all around the engine bay, like I said, get back in the car. This is when you wanna test every electronic component in the car. Blare that radio, run the windows up and down, turn the wipers on, go at it. Heated seats, climate control, all that. Get it out of your system now. Check everything you wanna check now. Once you're on the test drive, you want as complete silence as possible, no distractions. When I go to a car lot to test drive a vehicle or look at buying a vehicle, uh, normally uh, salesmen do not like me. I am uh, not a very friendly person to do business with as they think, because normally when we're on the test drive portion of the buying process, I tell the salesman to sit down and shut up politely. And we have a very awkward, silent test drive. You want to use your ears when you're on that test drive. Most valuable tool, when you can't get under there and do visual or manual inspections with tools. You know, while you're going through the parking lot, go over speed bumps, go over potholes, see if you hear any pops, creaks, rattles, fill that stuff out. You got some pops and shimmies going on, you could have a uh, bad ball joint, you could have bad sway bar end links. Cut the wheel all the way left and all the way right, make some sharp turns. You're hearing a clicking, you got bad CV axles in the front. Uh, are you hearing uh, noises once you get up to speed. Are you hearing roaring wheel bearings? Are you hearing driveline issues in the rear with the differential, at the prop shaft in the middle, the transmission coming from the tunnel? Uh, if you notice vibration back and forth from the steering wheel, you could have a vehicle that had aftermarket CV axles put on it that's notorious for causing a vibration in the steering wheel. You could also have a bad alignment or the tires may be bad biting the wheel. That's also a possibility as well. When you go to brake, be very aware of what's happening when you put your foot on the brake. Are you getting a shaking steering wheel when you're braking? You might have warped rotors. Is your butt shaking in the seat? The back of the car shaking on brake application could be warped rear rotors. But these are things you wanna be aware of and be sure to take in as much information as you can. Cars will tell you 
very, very large amounts of information about their condition if you're just willing to sit and listen to what they have to tell you. It does take years of training to get dialed into that, to listen and know and translate cars language, but the cars will talk to you. They will tell you what's wrong with them. After the test drive, be sure to smell all around the car. See if you smell coolant, see if you smell oil, gear oil, any fluid, anything burning. Uh, don't be afraid to stick your head back under there and see if you can see something leaking that wasn't previously. Uh, once the car heats up, sometimes, uh, you know, an oil leak isn't visible until the engine's running and the oil pump's pushing oil and it's leaking due to the oil pressure. So things don't always look and have issues the same sitting as they do after they've been driven. Pop the hood, look for smoke. Smoke is a great indicator of fluid leaks on Subaru engines because of the boxer design and the exhaust being at the bottom. Any fluid that leaks down from the engine most likely will contact part of the hot exhaust and then smoke or billow up or cause a smell. So be sure to check for any smoke. Smoke will basically lead you to where you need to see. If it either is at the back side of the engine, front side of the engine, left or right great to pinpoint leaks that you might have missed before. So we have done our inspection of our tires. We've done an inspection visually of the engine bay and fluids. We've visually inspected the rear and front suspension components. We have visually inspected for any collision damage. We've gone on our test drive. We've used our sense of smell and sense of hearing to diagnose or to listen for any potential issues that would not show their head until the vehicle was in motion and things were turning. We've basically been able to check as accurately and precisely as possible without jacking up the vehicle, without getting underneath the vehicle, without rolling out expensive tools, how the health and condition of the vehicle you plan to purchase is. So hopefully you find this helpful in your next purchase of a Subaru vehicle, whether it be from a dealership, used car lot, or from an individual. Hopefully you'll remember these practices and go through these inspections. Again, I cannot stress this enough. This does not guarantee you'll be free of issues. Rod bearing spin, transmissions blow, head gaskets leak, things happen. You cannot always check preventively in an inspection to know what's going to happen 100 miles down the road, 1,000 miles down the road, or 10 years later. It's not end all be all. You still could have an issue, but you're better equipped and have more knowledge of the vehicle you plan to purchase by following these steps and going by this guide. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.